Joy Joy Moon. Good morning, humans. Everybody's feeling okay? All right, um, and we were very honest with saying that I'm gonna be watching that timer up there and um, we apologize in advance for any tears. We apologize any, in advance if we just ignore y'all. Um, <laughs> and that's what me and Spesh have to do. She is special to me because she is my special little sister. Um, Delta Sigma Theta brought us together. Um, and it is, um, if, you, if you know anything about each one of our chapters, um, Spesh crossed here at VCU, it's Ada Ta chapter, and I crossed at the University of Virginia, the Caparo chapter. And for us to connect in a special sister way is not normal for chapters. So when I say Spesh, that is very endearing to me because not only is she my dearest friend, but also my special little sister. So I'm gonna call her Spesh the whole time. Um, also in saying that, um, housekeeping rules. Today she is not, but she will always be, Dr. Cisha Joy Moon. However, we're going we gonna, to we gonna chill with the doc today um, <laughs> because every day at work she is doctored to death. Also, we ain't talking politics today. If you got questions about that, go on, change your questions now. <laughs> okay? And we're going to respect the fact that she is in a position where let's just avoid that. We talk in Richmond and the truths about how she has come up in Richmond. So, you ready, Splash? I think so. All right, let's do it. Okay, <laughs> so first of all, <laughs> and also, Natasha, bring that baby back on down here because one of the truths is, is that that baby's gonna cry. That baby's gonna talk, but also that baby needs to see a black woman on this stage at the level to which she is. She may remember this a little bit later. So, does this work? This works, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh oh. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hey, Mar. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Smash. One thing I know about you, and when you walk into a room, you talk a couple of things. You lead with your blackness first, you lead with your womanhood, you lead with your identity and your pride. And then you let people know, I'm from Richmond. Talk about growing up in Richmond and how your truths were formed at an early age. Just but look at that, look y'all, look at that face right there. It's white dress right, right here, first row. Look at how she already got truth on her face. <laughs> Let's talk about your truths. Okay, well, okay, I'm gonna get into that. First, two housekeeping things for me. First, I'm a chief diversity officer, so I just have a couple of like housekeeping things I have to do. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers, for those that need to know. Um, if there's anybody who might be visually impaired in the audience, I just want for you to know that I'm a black woman. I have straight hair, I'm wearing a black fedora with black and white glasses, a black blazer, some jeans with a ripped denim and some stilettos that are black as well. Um, so that's one. Um, second, oh, and I have a banging red lips that Nicole Gore put in. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, thank you, Nicole. Um, second, I just want to thank y'all for being here. Um, it's 8.30 in the morning. You could be anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us. I don't take that lightly. Um, y'all could be asleep. You could be at work. You could be on vacation, starting to be with your families for the holidays. I asked multiple people multiple times, like, what are registrations looking like? Because I thought it'd be empty. Mm -hmm. So just thank you guys for being here with me. I just want to say it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what it feels like to be from Richmond and what my experience was like. Um, I grew up in Bird Park, uh, right across the street, literally from Bird Park. My dad is from Blackwell, so I'm a product of both. Um, and not Manchester. Yeah. Blackwell. Blackwell. <laughs> um, for those of y'all don't know, that's over South Side. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's my upbringing, like in a true intersection. My dad 
He's worn many hats. Um, he social activist, a little bit of music, you know, a little bit of street to him, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. My mom came from a very academic uh, background, very privileged. So to see the intersection of my dad coming from the mud, you know, my mom coming from a certain level of status, um, I think I'm a byproduct of both of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being from a place like Bird Park, which also has changed drastically over the years, it's a place that, you know, when people think about Black Richmond, they think of Churchill, um, they think of Northside, but a lot of Black people grew up in West End and it kind of like gets kind of lost in the narrative. Uh, but this is a place that on Sundays you would roll your windows down mm -hmm. and blast your music on Sundays and just ride your car in a circle just to stun on them. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that was my upbringing. Um, I never recognized, but you know, thinking about truths, I went to John B. Carey with Caroline. Um, I did not know until recent years mm -hmm. that um, it was named after Confederate soldier. And so, but when I look back at my childhood, like some of those truths were always there, even though I might not have known it. And I think in that moment, I recognized that my truth was gonna start to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> it started probably at that age, because I'm a little bit of August, I'm a little bit of Michon. And um, I think the first time that the truth hit me was in third grade. I ran for class, I ran for school president. Mm -hmm. Not just class, school president, third grade. And they let me run. You, uh, the letter that you wrote. Oh, I yeah, remember a the whole letter. letter. Uh, they let me run, I remember my slogan, shoot for the stars, but you'll land with the moon. I was <laughs> on it, I was ready. <laughs> it was a whole campaign. And they let me run, and then I won. And yeah. I beat a fifth grader. Yes. And then the principal called me and my mom and I was like, well, she can't really be the president. And I was like, but you let me run. Yeah. They, were like, but they told my mom, but she wasn't supposed to win. She's in third grade. And that was the first time I stood up for myself and told my truth. And, you know, first time I got in trouble um, yeah. for, for doing so. Yeah. But I, you know, I didn't recognize what my voice was supposed to do, how I was supposed to lead necessarily in those moments. But I will say it's the intersection of Blackwell and Bird Park that I think brought me to that very first truth in the third grade. You left John B. Carey. And you got real, real interesting at St. Gertrude's. <laughs> Smash. I mean, the garter belts. Can we talk about this at the, at the all girls play? <laughs> and, and sponsors, Lauren, who's from Creative Morning, you know, she knows very well. Okay, yeah. let's, you, you went on to a, a all girls school and again, being the daughter of August, knowing your roots and your heritage, mm -hmm. how was your high school transition? Well, what's interesting, <laughs> um, also can we shout out Maria? Maria went to VCU, she's one of the mm -hmm. most uh, famed uh, female basketball player, women basketball players in VCU's history. Yep. Just wanna give shout out to Maria. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's interesting, I went to community my freshman year. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to go to St. Gertrude. Speaking of fear of kilts, I really like the uniform. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I wanted to go because it's like you didn't have to put a lot of effort into getting dressed every day. You had a uniform. I don't know. I just wanted to go to St. Gertrude. I wanted to be with Caroline. It's a lot of reasons I wanted to go to St. Gertrude. Oh, okay. Um, but it also got me in trouble mm -hmm. again because I went into this um, significantly white space. It was only six black people who graduated in my class. And the first truth really hit me when we went on a field trip, which now comes full circle in my life. We went to, Mon we went to Monticello. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, you know, we go and we spend like two or three hours in the house. And they have preserved everything from Thomas Jefferson, even down to spoons. And that experience happens in the house and then we go outside and we go to Mulberry Row, which is where the enslaved laborers used to live, but it was nothing, it was just dirt there. They've now reinterpreted the space and reconstructed it, but at the time it was nothing. I'll never forget the tour guide told us to close our eyes and imagine what it looked like. Mm. And I just remember being so insulted because they spent so much time on the bricks. I, I don't know, I just remember them talking about the bricks and they talked about how Thomas Jefferson's home was preserved but did not talk about the laborers who built the bricks mm -hmm. to then have a, a figure that, or, or a property that could still be around 200 years later. Um, and then for the people that are responsible for this estate, you told me to close my eyes and imagine because preserving our histories wasn't important. Mm -hmm. That next week, it was a talent show at St. Gertrude. Mm. And I wasn't signed up originally. I know you weren't. 
But then I signed up. Mm. And I just pretty much told them how much I did not ex appreciate the experience and to be more mindful when you take people like me into spaces on field trips. I got in trouble again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and little did I know, you know, now at this point in my life, the conversation about bricks, reconstructing histories, um, preservation, that it would all come full circle. But that was a very formative time for me to mm -hmm. go to a school like that, to understand what it's like to be marginalized. Like, mm -hmm. I don't consider myself a minority because when you walk into different rooms, majority and minority statuses can change. Mm -hmm. I was marginalized in that space and I was trying to push myself to the center. And so I, it, it was very important. So I'm glad I went there beyond just the kilts. Um, I walked away with a lot from going to St. Gertrude. What's your relationship with the school now? Do you have one? Have you, have you voiced any concerns about any current states? Well, you already know. I know. They had I just wanted them to know. They had, black, <laughs> they had a blackface incident a couple of years ago, and I made sure to make my feelings known about making sure it's a safe space for black students. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's so. interesting. Um, Anjali said she could have never went to mm -hmm. St. Gertrude's. Mm -hmm. And like there are times where she would get the calls yeah. <laughs> instead of your mom getting the calls because you were being very St. Gertrude's. I, well, this is the crazy part, you know, about like narrative shapes, mm -hmm. narrative shaping. The truth is, I was a, we were wild at St. Gertrude, okay? Yeah. Like, I, we were doing some crazy stuff. Like, by the time I got to college, it was like, oh, y'all just, this your just first time that. doing that? Yeah, oh, yeah. I was doing that like ninth yeah. grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whew. Yeah. I, I see some people I went to high school with that I know, know this. Yeah. So uh, the, the dynamics at St. Gertrude, it's so interesting. It's like we would do things that we should not be doing in the houses of the parents and the families because the perspective of their parents were we have, so, we have a lot to lose. So if you're going to be reckless, be reckless in the house. Mm -hmm. So we can't protect you, no drinking and driving, no, all of that type of stuff. Versus Anjali with the TJ. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing any of that because they knew they would get in like locked up type of trouble. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So my mom, I, like I would go to a party and be like, mom, I'm at Paige's house. And I really would be at Paige's house. So my mm -hmm. mom could call Paige, talk to Paige's mom. I'm not lying. Yeah. Versus Anjali, it was like click clink on her childhood. <laughs> and the yeah. truth is I was probably the one doing the more problematic things. But when we talk about narratives, you think the white space the private space, the rich space, is the safe space, mm -hmm. the responsible space. Mm -hmm. When the truth is, when I look back, Anjali and her, her friends growing up, they were the most responsible, honorable people ever. Yeah. Um, but that's just not how the narrative uh, played itself out in our childhoods. Yeah. Then you said, I'm not going far. I'm going to stay right here. Mm -hmm. What made you choose VCU? I didn't. I didn't get into George Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and because of that. Oh, but but no, I'm mean, just telling the truth. Yeah. But God put you where you're supposed to be. All day. I was supposed yeah. to be a VCU. Yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't have I wouldn't change the I wouldn't change a thing about it. I was at I was at a time at VCU on the hills of like a Lorna Pinkney, rest in peace, mm -hmm. um, who like set the groundwork for a lot of what me, you, Faith, a lot of people at VCU, Bub, yeah. you know, all of these people who then created a space in VCU that VCU is now today. We worked hard on the hill, on the shoulders of a Lorna so that the kids today can have the VCU that they're experiencing. Yeah. And, you know, we talk, I know we'll talk about this later, about Richmond versus RVA. Like, I was probably the last class of, of Richmond yeah. before this RVA came to be a thing. Yeah. And so, again, I find no, nothing's by accident. Mm -hmm. Even crossing Delta, meeting mm -hmm. you, you know, growing up, my whole family is, you know, are AKA. You gonna tell them how you met me? Oh, you can tell them. Okay. But I will say, I, I, my whole life I was gonna be AKA because I did debutante, I did, I did all the AKA things. My grandmother was an AKA. I thought I was gonna do that and until I met the Deltas. And then I was like, oh no, my spirit is clearly a Delta if you yeah. get to know me. Um, you came, she came, I was working in the Siegel Center. I was, uh, I forgot what my role was. And all of a sudden, the, I just felt this energy come flying down the hall. 
And I, I had already seen you at women's basketball games, um, but I didn't know um, who you were. Um, and you literally came flying down the hall of the Siegel Center and you were like, look, I'm a Delta now. Like, you, you're gonna love me and you're gonna like me. And I was like, okay, um, I will. And then your mom rolled up on me. Like, you know, my daughter's a Delta now and I think she'd like you. And I was like, hi, I'm Kelly. Nice to meet you. <laughs> And I don't think it stopped. I mean, that's kind of when I knew you were the real deal and authentic because you haven't changed since then. So, Fesh me to a Be More Club. Track yeah, I mean, by I, Ronnie B. Yeah, I did. I did too much with that. I got in trouble with my chapter because, again, I, 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 I brought someone in that, you know, it just wasn't heard of. But we did, did it very special because I felt like you deserve that. And that's the give and take that we have is that, mm -hmm. you know, we, na we now know what each other likes and what each other deserves. Yeah. So um, Delta's held me down in so many ways, particularly in my current role. So it was the best decision I've ever made between that Black Caucus, so many things about VCU uh, were formative. I mean, now even to see that it's now uh, deemed a minority serving institution is pretty apropos if you ask me because I mean, Faith is here, she can tell you. The way that her and Bub used to have uh, the APB, Commonwealth A and B uh, popping, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't have thought you went to a PWI. Yeah. I mean, people from Union and Virginia State were yeah. on the road to come and party at, at uh, VCU because you just felt like there was a black experience here. Yeah. Um, and I will say this, Bash, you challenged administration. I'd sit in meetings sometimes and her name would come up and I'd just put my head down and be like, oh, what does she do now? Black caucus, um, remember the black ball? Yeah. Yeah, oh I mean, gosh. you really, really, if, oh, yeah. if you know any black students at VCU, they need to give you, you know, I mean, like, they need to give you your props for the fact that you challenged administration, you made sure that bylaws, procedures, like, you held people accountable, and I think they weren't ready for that at a young age. I mean, from not only just black caucus, but what you were doing with residential life and housing, you know, like, all of these different um, factors in building the culture that is now at VCU. You had your hands in it. I will say this, you know, and to VCU's credit, I would get in trouble again because mm -hmm. I would be vocal, but VCU never made me feel like I did not belong. Yeah. Like, I will say that about VCU. Dr. Rohn, Dr. Peebles, Carmen Bell, Dr. Rodriguez. It was a space here where I felt like I at least could challenge, mm -hmm. you know, even down to step shows and... Yeah, all the things. And I would get in trouble for some of the things that you would do because, anyway, by association. So, um, you left VCU. Yep. I um, went to our rival at but, the time. But wait, let's, but you, you're a double RAM though because you got your undergrad and your master's mm -hmm. from VCU. Mm -hmm. um, and then you decided I'm going to go all the way. Mm -hmm. why, why did you feel you needed a doctorate? Uh, again, truth, I didn't know what to do next, and my, my family all had doctorates, so I was like, okay, well, we're just going to stay in school here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're just going to keep on going. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it wasn't, I mean, just to be honest with you, I knew I always wanted to be in government, so uh, my other two degrees, but I didn't know what to do after my master's, so I was just like, well, I'm just going to stay in school. So, went there, followed in my mom and my cousin Nicole, um, Dr. Parsons Pollard's footsteps, and just went and got the same degree that they did. Um, you um, just imagine this person, this little person with a hoodie, baggy jeans, some Tims, um, and a book bag rolling up to ODU's doctoral program. Like, let me in yeah. the doors. Yeah, talk I was only about, 24. Yeah. Talk about your truths with that and, and, and what you had to maybe not be as truthful about and how that affected where you are. Well, I was true fun, it got me. Now that got me in a lot of trouble at ODU. ODU was, ODU was, every, see everything happens for a reason. Like I don't look back at these experiences, I, I look back at these experiences and smile, mm -hmm. even though when I was going through them, of course, I wasn't. A lot of tears, but ODU was hard. Mm -hmm. So I got in trouble at ODU before I even walked in the door, like before I even got in the U-Haul to move there. I was offered two assistantships. So one was a research assistantship and the other was to be a resident director for Res Life and Housing. And I chose the residential life and housing because if anybody's in that uh, career, you, you'll know that you get free housing, free room and board, a stipend. Mm -hmm. So it's a really lucrative package. Mm -hmm. uh, research assistantships, 
it was like a $10,000 stipend and you had to work your butt off plus coursework. So I went with the $25,000 package. And before I even got down there, the program director told me that I wasn't serious about my academics because I went with the more affordable option for someone like me from an underserved community that needs that. Yeah. And he just couldn't understand, he couldn't reconcile that I'm going with the equitable accommodation for me. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, it was already a problem. First night of class, I go to class. Mind you, we just moved students in, so I'm wearing my work clothes, and my work clothes are a hoodie and jeans and Tim's. I mean, that's, I'm from Richmond, like, and I just moved people in. I'm wearing my, my professional attire. But I'm only 24 when the average person in a PhD program is in their 40s to 50s, so they just left work. They have families. Their work attire is a, is a three-piece suit. Mm -hmm. And he just couldn't understand me. He was like, you just, you just don't take this seriously. Um, mind you, end up graduating top of my class, but he just couldn't reconcile who I was and that I can be in a hoodie and still be smart. Yep. Um, and so that's how that program started. And it wasn't easy. I mean, that, that, that one challenged me even down to, you know, we were talking about it earlier, writing my dissertation. And my dissertation was about the, inter the, role, the impact of intersectionality on career mobility trends of women of color in the federal government. Little did I know it would mm -hmm. lead, you, you know, go. foreshadow my whole life and career in federal service. But I was advised to take the word oppressive or oppression out of my dissertation because it would make the white faculty members uncomfortable. And then I wouldn't get the green light to finish my PhD. Um, and so even in that moment, it took, a, it took my chair to say to me, your dissertation is the start of your journey, not the end. Just take it out and then do a scholarly peer review article, you know, to put it back in. But that moment was an eye opener for me because I understood he was saying it from love. But when we think about like intergenerational differences, this was an older black 70 year old man trying to tell me how to navigate oppressive systems, even down to taking the word oppressive out of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And our generation is, no, if it's an oppressive system, let's change it. Yeah. Um, and we just couldn't see eye to eye in that moment. But I mean, I took it out to acquiesce um, to him and he is now a dear mentor of mine. But ODU was hard. Um, and, and, and the one thing I've learned is that I'm no different than the average black woman that goes to get a PhD. If you read any studies, we all have very oppressive experiences and it actually gets worse for black women that enter academia and actually enter as scholars. Um, it's just a very difficult um, environment. What's your relationship with ODU right now? Um, I know one big thing happened out of your relationship with ODU, but what's your relationship with ODU right now? Well, yeah, I met my wife at ODU. Mm -hmm. I met one of my best friends at ODU. ODU, ODU was like a bittersweet uh, moment. Um, I have a, uh, I'm in, I mean, I'm in touch with the president's office. So, um, because once I got this role, you know, Luckily, my alma maters are proud of me and want to be in touch. And but you know, I let the president know what was up. That was your truth. That was my truth, and I told him about my experience. And I said that was nearly 20 years ago. I hope it's not the same yeah. for students of color how it was for me. So yeah. we had a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So <laughs> then you decided that I want to be in this true game of being in D.C., being in. And engulfed in what DC is about. Can I just say something real quick? Do you remember I was crying going through the tunnel of Norfolk because I was so scared to leave Richmond and had the breakdown? Can you remember that? That's was so I, crazy. Was on the phone? Yes, we were on the phone. I was driving to ODU, about to go through the tunnel, and broke down because I cannot believe I was leaving Richmond. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I just thought about that. Go mm. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. You had a lot of those little moments, though, Smash. I did. I was petrified to leave Richmond. Like, yeah. when you stay in the space till 24, I don't know. I was just nervous. Yeah. Richmond's all I, I knew. Yeah. You Richmond. came back a lot, though. You, you came and back a lot. Do. And you brought ODU to Richmond I a did. lot. Yeah. So, um, but, so, we, Lord have mercy the time. All right. So, um, anyway, you, 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 you got to D.C. Um, your first internship was in D.C. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about your first internship to D.C., and then let's get into what this line is about. Okay, so I finished my coursework. I'm working on my dissertation. I knew I wanted to move to D.C. My wife is from Woodbridge. Well, she's from Germany by way of Woodbridge. But um, 
uh, I knew I wanted to work in government, but I was going to this Mark Warner job fair that was being advertised in Stafford. I'm thinking there's only gonna be, you know, kids like me there, but it was right on the heels of the recession in like 2010. And so it made the national news because it was over 4,000 people showed up, helicopters, because they could not believe it. And so I had to stand in this line with over 4,000 people for like eight hours just to even get in the door. Mm. Um, and out of all of those people, I landed an internship at the Department of Commerce. And, you know, I start, I mean, like, I started at the bottom. I was, I was living in affordable uh, housing when I moved to the DMV. I was using my student stipend. I was making pennies, but I landed in the office of the secretary and the black man that you just saw was the assistant secretary for Department of Commerce. And that was my first gig on the blue carpet as part of the um, uh, Obama-Biden administration. Mm -hmm. But started off scheduling meetings, getting coffee. I mean, doing what you have to do just to get your foot in the door. Humility is probably your truth during that time. Um, you just, you didn't know which way you were going and- Wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. Still have all those relationships with Mr. Stephen A. Crispus from that photo. I wouldn't have changed standing in that line for anything. It was hard to watch though, because that was after the recession. And so to see other people have to humble themselves, people that are like 60 years old who lost their jobs and are in there standing in line because they need to feed their family. Mm -hmm. Like they had no choice. That was actually a very hard experience because mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue a career. They needed a career. Mm. Mm. It, it was, it was, that was actually, yeah. Mm. That was a game changer. You then went, and this table right mm. here is very important to you because you found yourself a seat mm -hmm. at it. I'll never forget, this is 2014. I had to go to a meeting at work. You know, like, again, start off as an intern, move my way up. You might be a point in your career where you're not at like the main table yet. So you're at the, like the seats around the main table. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at that point in my career. And I was okay with that being where I was in my career, but the fact that there was no one at the table that looked like me. I remember snap taking my phone out and taking a picture and I sent it to myself and I said, if I'm ever put in a position of authority or power influence, tables will never look like this. Mm -hmm. This is 2014. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I took that picture. Um, because it's like my own personal reminder, because mm -hmm. that was not okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I'm not even joking, that, that is like a source of inspiration for me. I keep that picture with me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, moving, moving on to, um, before we get there though, um, one of the things that I just always remember is you okay, come- Okay, hold on. Yeah. I'm with get, you, get, I'm with Get you. yourself I'm together. You. I'm with you. Um, <laughs> is you coming home, and I'm trying to wrap this up, y'all, and, and if y'all sneak out because you got to go back to work, I understand. Um, you coming home often, and this was our view, right? We would go out, we would have a good time, but when we got back to wherever we were, we were on a couch. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget the night where you were asking me all these questions because you felt like you were a little disconnected. And I said to you, it's Richmond versus RVA right now. And you looked at me like, what in the world does that mean, first of all? And then I felt like you had this aha moment of, oh, I'm going to fix that. We're going to change that. Or at least make them intersect. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was coming home, I felt like a stranger. And it was like, RVA was this rebranding initiative, and it's been effective. But you can't redevelop over hurt <laughs> with no healing. And... I felt like that's what I was seeing. You know what I'm saying? And I just couldn't, I didn't know why the ancestors had put that on us at, on the couch that day, but it's all coming full circle now. But, um, you know, I grew up when it was Sixth Street Marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up again, like when there was Bird Park. Mm -hmm. I grew up when there was a Hall Street Day Christmas parade with a black Santa. Mm -hmm. Like, I grew up in a very different Richmond. Mm -hmm. Skate land, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? The Huguenot game, you might want to go before the let out because it <laughs> might get it might a get little there. bit lit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's the, that's the Richmond I grew up in. So I couldn't recognize it mm -hmm. um, fully, especially when it became a, a city of transplants. Mm -hmm. And some of the communities I grew up in, grew up spending time in like a Churchill. I didn't see people that looked like me in those spaces anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that was maybe like five, five years ago mm -hmm. that we had that conversation and now it's coming full mm -hmm. circle. And what you did was you started with this one seed 
in your mind. Y'all, we were supposed to run four miles. What were we supposed to do? Four uh -huh. for four? We were supposed to do this four, four miles? Four miles along the James, the Richmond Project. Yeah, one in four mm -hmm. black Americans can trace their roots back to Richmond. And so, Spash and Anjali had this whole plan about doing this um, uh, four mile thing. And then all of a sudden, Anjali goes, can you tell me who Jackson Ward is named after? Mm -hmm. Sister, can you do that? Can you just 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 find this little teeny tiny information mm -hmm. for me? And you went there. Well, yeah, because you know I'm looking, I like truth. Yeah. So I needed to know the truth, and I heard like four or five different Jacksons, and it led me down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, Giles B. Jackson is the only person that is really worthy of the honor. Um, being the first barred black attorney in the state of Virginia. Um, and I'd also say Dr. Um, James uh, Jackson also, who's the first black pharmacist on Lee Street, also is worthy. But the other three, Andrew Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, um, and Joseph Jackson, who clearly was a, a pretty decent white man of the time, early 1800s, who had a pleasure garden because he actually took in Abraham Peyton Skibworth's granddaughter as um, one of his, um, I guess you could say he was his, her, guardian. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, it led us down this rabbit hole to recognize that the first historically black neighborhood in this country, being Jackson Ward, actually is deeply rooted in Confederate origins, mm -hmm. um, down to the, not only the name convention of the ward, but the streets that, it, that even um, still till today um, define the neighborhood. And also understanding the original footprint. So when we talk about space and marginalization, the original Jackson Ward, as most people don't know, actually extended past the Main Street Station. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just like the, the decimation of that community, people think about Interstate 95, but it really happened in 1871 for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Your truths now are built upon your research, built upon the fact that you really, really, there's no doubt about you knowing where you came from. Um, and how has those truths allowed you to be in the position that you are today? I think what's so interesting is that like, so George Floyd, that whole situation happens. And or even in this moment, I wanna hold space for anybody who did the hard work in Richmond in 2020, out in those streets. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing that's, that's different about Richmond, those statues came down in a lot of different cities, but Richmond is the only place where the people brought down the first one. Come on. Wasn't, it wasn't the politicians, it wasn't, it wasn't an organization. The people one night got the ancestors just took a hold and said, we're done here, yeah. and yanked that joint down yeah. and then threw it in the water. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was on, I mean, I was on IG like, oh, Richmond is going off right now. <laughs> <laughs> you were so hot. You so were so hot. Like, you wanted to get here so bad. <laughs> like when we do this work everybody can't do all aspects of the work yeah. they're supposed to be a protester they're supposed to be a policy maker they're supposed to be a researcher and I knew I couldn't join because I would compromise the lane that the ancestors mm -hmm. assigned me mm -hmm. to do the work but I was over here like in full solidarity I think ease might be I was sending water money for water like mm -hmm. do that do that mm -hmm. I was proud of what was happening but I say all that to say that was the last time that you know, sometimes, some, sometimes we code switch at work. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm no longer doing that. So I was about to interview for this gig to be the first chief diversity officer. Code switching means that you, you, you remove your authentic self, your authentic ways of speaking, so that you make other people in the room comfortable. Boom, wait a, you did that? That was a good definition. Thanks, <laughs> um, yeah, and so I said, I'm not, I was going up for this interview and I said, I'm not code switching. I'm one of the first chief diversity officers appointed in the federal government at this time. So I was risking it. And I think I told Jam, my wife, I said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go in here to see you. And so, you know, they always give you the first question. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> so my intro sentence was, my name is Dr. Cisha Joy Moon. I'm a black woman from Richmond, Virginia. I'm queer and know Richmond's more than just being the former capital of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Like that was my first intro sentence. And they were just kind of like on the virtual screen, like. <laughs> 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 oh, that's your intro. All yeah. right. Um, and <laughs> I, I don't know, just something about all the energies of that year that how I show up now is really I'm, I'm black and I'm from Richmond and that's what you're gonna get in every room I walk into and what's so crazy is when I look back at my life now and all of those moments from third grade that got me in trouble mm -hmm. that is why Speaker Pelosi appointed me mm -hmm. and on that note 
We got some questions. I know we got some questions out there. This last photo is really her living her truce and where she is right now. So, um, we're going to only we... do one. We are at time. Okay. We understand. We try to respect time. We have time for one question. Make it good. <laughs> okay. I see. I see. A, yes. I see you. I'm coming. No, this is the last. No, this is speaker's bathroom. This is oh. the last book. Is that who you work with? Here you go. Yeah, my team. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. picture shows everyone around for a team. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So nice she to meet you. Um, your story is incredible, and Thanks. thank you for coming to the ICA today. Um, What's your name? I'm Logan. Logan, Hi, Logan Cooper. I'm the Community Media Center Assistant for the recording studio just I'll keep going. past the, um, the gallery on the Very second nice floor. Very nice to meet you. Um, the part that really... I was able to relate to about your story was the part where you mentioned a special mentor and I know somebody personally he's the director of that space who he um, he's not here today but he has been very very helpful to me professionally and personally so how do you continue to go forward and also pay homage to the people who have helped you and really shaped you into who you are and have given you that space and that energy um, I think it's because I take them in every, I, I say this all the time, I take Richmond in every room that I can with me. And that's the people that are my direct ancestors versus those who are like my community ancestors. Um, when I get, like when I give answers now, it's not just through the lens of the work I do as it relates to being like a chief diversity officer, but I hold a lot of space for Jackson and I hold a lot of space for other people's work. Um, a prime example, I had a meeting with the president of, um, the National Urban League, and we're talking about things as it relates to Congress, and once we're done with that, I said, all right now, now we gotta pivot. I wanna tell you about two organizations, Jackson Ward Collective and Rich Black Restaurant Experience, and I start showing him all of the different Thanks, spaces Beth. here. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that it's important, yes, to pay homage to the ancestors that are no longer with us, but also the ancestors that are in the, the making. Yeah. And so like, I really do try to hold space for my tribe in the work that I do, because I'm in these rooms that you never would have fathomed that people that look like us are in. Um, and so I think you have to just move with great intention. I think that's the biggest thing of DIA work, just in general. Some people think, you can create equitable and inclusive and accessible spaces organically. No, you have to do it with purpose. You have to be mission driven to, to actually create those spaces. So I try, to, I try to keep that in mind with me and take people with me any, with any opportunity I get. Mm -hmm. And that's even this photo. This is my team. You know, I'm able, I was able to leverage my position to ask the speaker to go to her balcony. This is the balcony where like, presidents are, like the Pope goes, you can't just get here. And, <laughs> and she was like, okay, well, you know, I got permission for me to go. And I was like, well, no, I, I don't go to places alone. Can I bring my team? And not only did she let me bring my team, but she let me bring a photographer and let us spend an hour there. And this is the week before the election and just gave us access mm -hmm. and access. You're looking at immigrants in this picture. You're looking at queer people in this picture. You're looking at all different identities and experiences and she just let us soak it up and look over the entire capital um and so i think these moments taking others with you and paying it forward in like real time is like really really important and i love this picture because it was also like now just be yourself like of course we took the professional stuffy one but it was like can we just have one where you can live in your truth and so now this is like my favorite photo ever yeah that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. I think that if anybody has any questions, will you be around for yeah. a few, just a few moments? Mm -hmm. We'd like to make sure that that happens. But everybody, thank you. Michelle, before you end on that, let me just say, thank you, Smash. Um, you are truly living your truths. The ancestors are extremely proud of you. I want you to make sure that you take that in, because sometimes we talk, and she goes, Smash, I can't believe so-and-so happened. Believe it happened, because it happened for a reason, and the ancestors got your back through all of this. Keep doing that great work and making Richmond proud and making black women proud. And again, just kudos to you. Thank you.